Welcome back, everyone. I'm here today with Jonathan Mayberry. We're going to talk a little bit about his biography and then the hotly anticipated book that he has coming out of uh, Keg and the Damned. Jonathan, welcome. Thanks for having me here, Sean. Thanks for spending your, your very valuable time with me. I really appreciate it. Well, sometimes it's nice to just kick back and have a conversation. It's always nice to kick back and have a conversation. So just tell the audience for, for folks, for the you know five people living under a rock, tell people briefly about your background, and then I, I want to get into how you got into writing. Well, I'm a, currently, I, I'm a full-time working uh, writer. I, I write uh, novels in, in a whole bunch of different genres, science fiction, fantasy, horror, thrillers, mysteries. I write comics for IDW, Dark Horse, and Marvel. Um, I edit Weird Tales magazine. I edit anthologies, and I teach writing. So my whole world right now is is books and writing, and I am having the time of my life. So how did you get into the the writing uh, you know gig? I, I know that you sold sold your first novel, uh, you know, kind of in your in your late forties. What? How did you get started? Did you start short stories? Did you like no, start I, with novels? It's it's a long and winding road. I mean, when I was a kid, I, I always wanted to tell stories, and I used to draw comics and share them with my friends in school. Um, but when I was in high school, you know, it was the post Watergate era, and I really wanted to be an investigative journalist, the kind of guy who broke the big story, toppled the corrupt government, all that stuff. And so I went to Temple University on a journalism scholarship, and um, with every intention of being a reporter. Midway through, I took a class on magazine feature writing and that changed my focus. And for the next, I don't know, 30 years, I did magazine features as a part-time gig. I did about 1200 feature articles and I don't know, 3000 fillers, reviews, columns, things like that. Um, my first book published was actually a nonfiction book, Judo and You. When I was teaching at mm -hmm. Temple University later on, uh, I was teaching martial arts history and women's self-defense. I wrote my own textbooks, but also I went up writing the textbooks for a few friends who, who were good teachers in different classes, but weren't necessarily comfortable writing their own book. So the judo textbook was written for my buddy, uh, who, uh, who was Norm, who was teaching the judo class. Um, but I never, you know, I never really wanted to wander back into fiction. I, you know, as a kid, when you think about writing, you think about writing stories. But as, as, a, as an older teen and young adult, I, I really felt that I wanted to be a reporter, then a feature writer. It wasn't until um, the late 1990s where I started getting the, the kind of the tingle for fiction. What happened is I had written a nonfiction book uh, called The Vampire Slayer's Field Guide to the Undead. It was all about vampire and other supernatural predators, uh, the belief systems around the world throughout history. And um, it was published under a pen name because my... My publisher at that time was afraid that uh, any book, uh, I had just published a bunch of notable mar martial arts books, nonfiction books, and um, <clears throat> it was sh shortly after that inducted into the uh, Action Karate uh, International Martial Arts Hall of Fame, partly because of my writing in, in the field. But I, I loved the research I was doing on weird monsters and, and so on, and I wanted to read books that were on the, on the folkloric versions of monsters, but I couldn't find many. So my wife said, well, stop bitching about it and just write one. So as an experiment, I, I decided to try to write a novel. And my wife, you know, made me a deal. She went back to work. She, you know, was getting the pay, bills paid and health coverage. And I parked my ass in a chair and I spent, you know, five years learning how to write, writing a novel, revising it, finding an agent and selling it. And that first book, Ghost Road Blues, uh, I got an agent really quickly. She sold it to the second publisher who, look, who looked at it, and it came out. Um, I was 48 years old. It came out in, in June of, of uh, 2016, uh, 20, 2006, rather, and um, that launched me into fiction. Um, I'm now writing my 46th novel. Um, it's been a busy few years. Um, and then um, shortly after that first novel came out, I started getting approached by uh, editors of anthologies to write short stories. And uh, I had never really liked the short story form as a writer. I always loved reading them, but I studied the form and did my best with it. And now I've written and I've sold 135 of those. So it's apparently fiction is where I should have been all this time because it's what I'm most successful at. It took me from being a part-time writer to a full-time writer and, a, and knock wood a successful one. Now, you know, you said you wrote 47 novels over that. Uh, 45 and working on my 46th. Yeah. 
how are you so productive? I mean, that's a massive amount of uh, well, output. The thing about writers is writers vary in terms of, of their drive, their energy, their stamina. And, you know, um, it's like some people are short, are, are, are sprinters, some are long distance runners, you know, and so on. Um, I'm in that class of high output writers. I like writing fast. And I, part of that's probably because of my magazine work, because, you know, I was, I was teaching during the day, uh, either at Temple University or later on as a jujitsu instructor. Um, and I only had a little bit of time to write. So I'd write an article really fast in one night. Um, and my journalism teacher was a, a, a psychopath who just made, gave us these drills to make us have to write really, really fast yeah. while also playing albums of sound effects like car accidents and babies crying and alarm clocks going off. So we had to write 2000 words in 90 minutes with that playing. I mean, so there was I, ha I was trained to write fast and I also like it. I like fast. Uh, I have friends who write like a book every couple of years, and that's the zone they like. That would drive me up a wall. Um, I, you know, I approach it as a job. So I write eight, uh, eight hours a day. I write 4,000 words a day, every, you know, every, every day. Um, less, a little less on weekends, obviously. Um, I take all, you know, I'm done in the evening because, uh, you know, it's family time. Um, and it's, it's my job. You know, if I was a, a plumber running a busy company, I'd have to be fixing pipes every day. So I, if you approach it like a job rather than waiting for the muse to speak to you, mm -hmm. you actually are more efficient. And also, if you pay attention to your process, looking for the things that waste your time, like I could watch dog videos on Instagram all day long, but I don't because that's not paying the bills. So I've, I've had to learn, you know, had to apply discipline. A lot of my martial arts discipline I've applied to writing where, you know, it's my job. Go do this now. That's what you need to do now. Now, do you consider yourself a plotter or a pantser? Oh, I'm definitely a plotter. In fact, I, I would like to get all of my friends who are pantsers and just very carefully slap them in the face really hard because it's so inefficient. Yeah. And for those watching, those who don't know the difference between plotting and pantsing, pantsing is somebody who sits down and just makes it up as they go, which can be fun and can sometimes result in really great works. But the problem is, since you don't know where it's going specifically, and you don't know how it ends, and you don't have that mathematical formula, which is a plot of cause and effect, you can't really plan ahead as well. You can't lay clues in a mystery e as easily. You wind up doing the deus ex machina stuff that, that Agatha Christie did, where she introduced uh, the key critical element in the last chapter and then revealed the, the, the murderer, which I think is, is, is a sign of poor writing. Yes, I understand Agatha Christie is very popular, but the reason, you know, it, I don't like that style. I really don't. Uh, I like knowing where it's going so I can build in foreshadowing and motif and, and, and subtext so that it's a richer story. When I get to the ending, there is a payoff that somebody looking back and say, oh, I can see, you know, how it got here, rather than it just suddenly being a surprise. Also, uh, plotting makes me faster. Um, you know, I write a book every, roughly every three months, write a novel every three months. So in that, you know, when I, when I step to do that, I have a bullet pointed outline. It's not a dense, everything is covered outline, because to me that, that cheats you of the organic process of discovery while writing. So the bullet point outline, I can, as long as I have that outline, I can jump anywhere in the, in the book and write a scene. If I'm not feeling you know, like I want to write a specific type of scene, I'll jump forward and write a fight scene, an action scene, a love scene, a comedy scene, something more entertaining. And then I'll go back and, and you know, once I've gotten, had my fun, go back and then advance the story more chronologically. Um, also with outlines, I tend to write the beginning and then jump forward and write the end. And then I back up and aim at that, aim at that ending, allowing for the story to change in the writing and even the ending to change when I get there. But the, the, the plot allows me to be much, much more efficient. And since this is my job, one does like to be efficient at one's job. Now, you mentioned process. Mm -hmm. When you're approaching a new novel, what does that look like from pre-outline to, because you know, there's a, I'm assuming with you, there's a research process involved yeah. to final published, not published, but manuscript that you deliver to your, well, yeah. actually, it, it's it's good to ask that because I'm working on that leading up to the start of my 47th novel, which I'll be doing probably in about uh, six weeks, starting in about six weeks. Um, what I do is, I since I know what I'm going to write somewhat in advance, 
especially now in my career, my agent has sold seven novels that I have not yet written. So, you know, I've got my next couple of years really cut out for me. But even at the beginning, I knew that like my first couple of books were going to be a trilogy. So I wanted to, I could, I could plot forward. My research starts first. I have an idea. Like the next book I'm going to write is called Cave 13. It's the 13th in my Joe Ledger series. Then it deals with the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I've been reading a lot about the Dead Sea Scrolls. I've been reaching out to archaeologists, historians, uh, theologians, and so on to get their take on it, as well as um, looking into some elements of international politics, because, you know, it's it's a weird science political thriller. Um, so I do my research in advance. I line up experts um, and will, you know, start asking questions of them. I'll rough in some of the material, like what I do with research. Since I, I, I'll I'll create a, a master document that'll be my master file, right? And I'll cut and paste bits of research right into that file, highlighted yellow, so I know it's not my writing. Um, that way, when I get to that section of the story, I can then focus on that, distill the information out of that into, into that scene or chapter or whatever, and then remove the, you know, the stuff that's not mine out of there. But I do a lot of that before I really get started. So even before I start writing the book, there's a master document with probably 40, 50 pages of just research stuff or responses from emails to experts that are cut and pasted in there. And I'm careful to make sure that everything is color coded. So, you know, so that I know it's not my writing because I've had I, I know a bunch of folks who have done similar things and they forgot what was theirs and what's not. And they want to accidentally plagiarizing, which is you know something we do not want to do. Right. Um, and then I, uh, when I actually get closer to the process, like I, I'll be writing the, the outline, the full outline for that book, probably about two to three weeks before I start writing the actual book. Because what I want to do is I want to write the outline, I'm still working on some other project, but I want it to cook in my head because it's not reasonable to assume that you've had all your best ideas the day you wrote your outline. Right. I mean, that's just... And some people think that once you've written the outline, it's it's wholly writ that you can't change it. And that's not the case. It is very malleable and always should be. Um, so that by the time I sit down to start writing it, I can dive right in. And, um, you know, I, I, as I said, I try to knock out a novel in every every three months. Kagan, which was my, what was my longest novel, um, 176,000 words, took me about three months to write. But I, I just finished the sequel to it. Son of the Poison Rose, which will be out in January, it's 207,000 words. That's my longest. That took me a little more than three months to do. All right. Now, we're definitely going to talk about Kagan, uh, you know, a little bit forward in this in this interview. Sure. But before before we, uh, you know, get there, there's one, one thing that it seems clear to me that you do very well, in addition to writing very well, which is the artistic component of being a successful writer. There's also a business component, which is, uh, as you mentioned, kind of selling, you know, having, having a, 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 I wouldn't say backlog, it's not the right word, but having a map of the next seven books that you have to write is both a good and a bad problem. But I'm sure most writers would, would love to have that problem. Yeah. But on the other hand, you know, there might, there, there's, there's a creative trade-off, right? Um, to a degree. I mean, you know, th those are books that I want, want to write. So it's not like it, they're just obligation books. You know, I actually map them out, want to write them and so on. The challenge for me comes w uh, the f with the fact that I, you know, new diet, new ideas are coming all the time. So mm -hmm. I have the next two years mapped out, but there are some ideas that have popped up that I would really want to write now. Sometimes I'll try to find a, a hole to write either a short story or a comic or something. Sometimes it just has to go on the back burner, but I, I don't forget it. It'll be the next round of things I pitch to my agent. Um, I want to make sure that I constantly have a future for my career um, because it is, you know, my, my sole income is, is, right. is this. Um, and at the same time, it's, it's fun knowing that these, these, these things are waiting for me. It's like there are unwrapped Christmas presents under the, under the tree that I, I will be able to open and play with. Um, so I know they're there. So that that is a sense of excitement and it fuels my creativity and also allows me along the way to, to spend some time in each of those future books in my head. You know, I make notes. I, I uh, Sometimes whole scenes will, will occur. The characters from those future books gradually become real 
and they, you know, they start talking in my head, scenes start showing up in dreams or when I'm meditating or relaxing. So I'm actually working on them now, but in a, in a, in a, a kind of a, a, a light touch way. Um, so I, I don't feel that there's any loss of creativity or creative freedom. It's, it's, it's the only thing, the only tough part is hours in the day. There's not enough of them. Now, I want to go back to the business question, but before I get that, yeah. there's something you raised that I want to definitely address. So when these ideas come to you for these future books, do you, you know, some authors will carry around like a little notebook. Um, some will include a, a file on their hard drive. How do you track these ideas? There you go. I dictate stuff to myself all the time. I send myself emails. Like if I, I subscribe to lots and lots and lots of, of um email or newsletters from scientific and political and, and, and cultural things. And you know, sometimes they'll have these really cool articles pop up. I'll send that to myself as an email. So I have the whole article, but, but with the name of that, of that project that it will belong to. Um, and I read tons of, of nonfiction for that same purpose. So, uh, uh, and I have notebooks everywhere. I'm never mm -hmm. more than I think three steps away from a notebook in, in, in my house. I've got one in my car. Um, so I'm, I'm constantly scribbling down ideas. I don't trust to memory, you know, not just because I'm in my sixties, but because memory is faulty and the original idea I want to capture, I will pause no matter what I'm doing and write that down. If I'm at dinner, I will, I will borrow a pen from somebody and write it down on a napkin. I don't want to lose the idea. Some ideas don't play out you know, mm -hmm. but some will, and some you have to kind of just sit with and, and think, well, is it, a, is it a marketable idea? Because there are some ideas I have, like, I would love to write a, a literary novel, and I would love to write a straight steampunk novel, and neither of them sell well enough for my agent to be enth enthused about them. And, you know, yes, I could write them, but the difference in what my agent would be able to sell a literary novel for, and what she could sell my next thriller for, is vastly different. And I would like to write a Western, Western self for pocket lit. I mean, unless you're writing a historical Western like Larry McMurtry, an action Western like Louis L'Amour, like I used to, to read growing up, mm -hmm. you know, th they will throw coins at, at your feet and that's about it. Um, <laughs> and it's not worth the, the, the time it's going to take me to write it in terms of a business decision. That's one of the creative things in business that, that becomes a problem. Some of your ideas are fun, but they are not, not uh, good for business. And, and that, by the way, is one of the reasons we save things on our on our drives and keep notes mm -hmm. because that can change. Like horror used to be a really bad word in publishing, and now horror is a very good word in publishing. Um, yeah, how did that how did that happen? I mean, it was like gigantic in the eighties, and uh, then like here's, it was just yeah. Here's, here's what happened. So mo more people watch movies than read books, and for mm -hmm. a long time, the most popular movies were slasher films. Uh, which are, you know, um, sexism and, and misogyny and, and, and it's just awful stuff, poorly plotted, body count stuff. Um, and because more people watch movies, they equate that with horror. They're marketed as horror, They're the most popular horror out there. And then in the, the 90s and 2000s, we started getting the torture porn, Saw and Hostel and things like that. Right. And it, it's repellent to a lot of people. And again, horror got blamed for it. Those things are such a tiny part of what horror is, but it's all, you know, unfortunately uh, caught in the same net. Then in, in the, uh, the mid 2000s, we started getting American Horror Story. We got Walking Dead. We got, um, uh, my God, so many TV shows and movies that, that are really popular that aren't body count sort of films, Insidious, Sinister, uh, all of those. And that rebranded horror for the next generation. And now this generation sees horror as, as something that can be anything from terrifying to, enter, you know, to, be, to fun, but it's not going to drench you in blood unless you're going to a very specific area. And, and that those sorts of films have now been more marginalized, thank God. Now, let's go back to the, the business question. In terms of you know selling books, you also have to market those books, and you have to be a promoter. And there's many like many like the, the the average I would say profile of an author is they tend to be more introverted, yeah. don't like to be around audiences. That aspect of the business promotion. Uh, what, what's your advice to authors? You know, not only not only introverts, but specifically to introverts about kind of the some things they might have to get over. 
Well, someone who was definitely introvert when I was a younger person and have my introverted moments even now, um, social media is, is critical. Um, ever since social media uh, became a thing, publishers realized that they don't need to put as much money into PR. They, they know that writers can and will do it. They force us to do it, so we have to do it. If we have to do it, we might as well do it well. Mm -hmm. I'm on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. I just started TikTok. You know, I'm on all these platforms. What I do is I budget time. Um, so like I use 10 minutes out of every writing hour to do social media. Um, that way I can spend 10 minutes on Twitter. I can put up a post. The post does not have to be about me and it does not have to be about writing, but there has to be a post every day. The consistency is more important than uh, business mm -hmm. focus in that regard. And in fact, if you are posting every day about your stuff, your writing, you're losing people. The only time that's really acceptable is when you're leading up to a book release. Then, yep. of course, you're going to you're going to push it more often. But most of the time, um, even though my posts don't appear to be about business, a lot of them, like I post a lot of a lot of funny memes, sarcastic, never mean. That's a big thing. Right, never go mean. Um, I, I, I make sure that my personal brand online is accessible and affable, never uh, confrontational, never egotistical. Um, and I use, you know, I, I look at how other people are doing social media and making decisions on whether that's something I can try or should try or not. Like, I don't buy uh, social media ads. I've never found them to be of, of any use. I would rather go on Facebook and start a conversation. Mm -hmm. And some of those conversations, again, aren't about me. Like, I, one of my favorites is putting up there, tell me what you're writing right now. What's yeah, your Yeah, I've seen those. Yeah. What's what's your latest release? Put up links, brag on this. Use my page to brag about your stuff because it's it's part of the community. If the whole community is thriving and we are able to increase engagement by readers because we're all having fun talking about pop culture, all of us actually do benefit. There is a sound business decision in that, that the personal branding is a, is a business decision. The sharing is a business decision. It's fun. I love it because I actually love the engagement. But at the same time, it's increasing awareness of me because I'm the platform. I'm the, I'm the page on which that conversation is happening. If there's a new Marvel uh, uh, trailer, I'm going to put it up as quickly as possible because I want people to have a conversation about it. I won't put it up and say, I, you know, I saw this, it's great, or I just saw this movie, it's fantastic. I'll say, new, uh, new Doctor Strange trailer, thoughts? I, engage, I want them to tell me what they're thinking so I can get a read. I can first enjoy their comments. Uh, I can get a read on what they do and don't like, which helps me understand more of the business side of the pop culture world. And um, you make new friends. Plus, uh, from a writer's standpoint, like early on when I, when I first got onto social media, and mind you, we're talking back in the Friendster and MySpace era. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember uh, those days. Yeah. I would, I would look for my, my favorite writers and friend them. I would look for booksellers and bloggers and friend them and librarians, love librarians, mm -hmm. and friend them. And then when they would talk about books they liked, I would repost or comment. It didn't have to be about me, but I have to be visible in that world. I have to be a, a part of that community because otherwise I, you know, you would appear as just someone will, uh, pandering in order to get, in order to make sales. That's not bad. That's not good business. Good business is being part of a community and then saying, oh, by the way, I have this. What do you think? And you wind up having more sales than you would if it's just me, 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 me. Now, how do you deal with the negative side of that? Like a ne when you get a negative review, how do you, or even somebody who comes to your page and just you know, tries to stir things up? Um, well, first off, I, I curate my pages. Uh, if uh, somebody comes and makes a comment that is out of line, um, I don't fight them on the page. What I will mm -hmm. do is I'll, I'll hide their comment, not to leave it, hide it, and then message them off board and, and say, look, you know, that, that comment was a little, little, you know, too political or too this or too that, whatever. Is there any chance you could reframe it? I give them the opportunity without shaming them in public, give them the opportunity to, to recast that, especially if I'm having a conversation. Um, I don't want someone to leave the conversation in anger. I want them to maybe reevaluate how they converse because conversation is good for good for everything. If people can have, actually have a conversation about things, we're, about any topic, we're likely to get further toward a shared understanding, even if we disagree. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want to shame people, you know? Yeah. Uh, so 
I've had, like, there are times in the past, I've even had a political discussion where I've curated it and somebody, or a controversial topic and curated it. And if somebody makes a comment like that, I'll hide the comment, talk to them, ask them if they could reframe it. Nine times out of 10, they will. And they'll become part of a more civil conversation. If they mm-hmm. don't, I block them and I move on and I forget they ever existed. You know, yeah. as far as reviews go, I made a mistake a long time ago. I have learned from way back, um, I think 2011, I think it was, um, I had a book come out and in this, in the same day, I got two back-to-back reviews. One was a, a five-star review saying best book ever, which is nice to hear, but it's not the best book ever. Let's face it. I mean, <laughs> it, took, I, it, was, it was a good book, best I could write at that time, but best book ever, it's a high bar. Um, and the next review was one star saying worst book ever. And it, <laughs> yeah. And, and first of all, that tells you all you should need to know about reviews. Um, but the, the, the one star came in when I was disgruntled about something else and I was in a, an angry mood. So I just made the mistake of responding and said, you know, one star, really silly review. You would have thought I had accused him of pedophilia. Um, he went ballistic on me and so did everyone else because they said that's a writer attacking someone. Um, you're not allowed to respond to a negative comment in any any way that shows disapproval because you're picking a fight. So after this thing blew up, I, I removed my comment. I, I, I wrote a comment to the guy. I said, look, I apologize. Caught me on a bad day. I appreciate your buying the book. Sorry it wasn't for you. And that was the end of it. And then Anne Rice, God bless her soul, decided that I needed a champion So for the next two years, she fought with this guy on that message thread, on that Amazon page for two years. I had to beg her to please stop. Um, And she eventually did. Uh, But that guy must have been so delighted that he spent two years. Yes. He was bragging to everybody. He was arguing with Anne Rice, you know. Yeah. Don't feed the trolls. Do not feed the trolls. You can't win. You can never win. The only thing you can do is try to shift an argument into a discussion. And if that's not working, you've got to, you've got to jump out of that plane, whether you have an air, a parachute or not, you know, you've got to flee. Well, and you also said one very important thing, which is thank you for buying my book. Yeah. The guy bought you, I'm assuming guy, it might, it might be woman, but un- unlikely. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, that person put their money up and bought your book. And yeah. whether they like it or not, you you provided them with a product and they bought a service and they didn't enjoy the service. So I have, it is what it is. Yeah, we've all bought stuff that we don't like. Doesn't mean that we have to hate the other person. And doesn't mean that if we th- if we don't like it, don't finish a, a meal because we didn't like it, that the chef has to come out and get into an argument with you. You know, um, so no, I, I'm, I'm, it's funny. I spent 58 years in martial arts and I am not confrontational. You know, my whole thing is I don't want to fight. Yeah. I can't fight. I don't want to fight. You know, wh- what's to be gained from that fight? Yeah. Well, unfortunately I'm, I'm Irish. So there's, <laughs> I'm a- Scottish. I mean, we, we can get into an argument. We can, we can dig our toes in. And I'm also a Taurus, which is supposed to make me stubborn, but you know what? I, I, t- I like redefining myself as who I prefer to be rather than who, you know, circumstances made me or tried to make me. Um, so I edit the version of myself that I want to be. Now, influences. Who would you consider your influences in the in the genre and just in, in general? Well, luckily, I've met most of my influences, which is one of the things when you become a writer, you never really expect. But early on, I met two people who were wildly influential on me. Uh, the middle school I went to, the librarian was a secretary for two different clubs of professional writers, one that met in Philly and one that met in New York. The Philly crowd was Sprague DeCamp and George Sithers, Lynn Carter. Oh, wow. It was the, the, the old swords and sorcery crowd, the Conan crowd. That was The group was called the Hyborian Legion, which was, you know, all Conan-centric. That'll be um, important later, audience. <laughs> okay. And then the New York crowd was kind of like more, not so much a club as as a very frequent series of cocktail parties at a, at a penthouse by a publisher. And he was into genre fiction. So every, this is 1970. So every time a genre writer of note was launching a book, they went to New York, parties would be built around it and we would go up. So I got to meet and be mentored by, for three years, Ray Bradbury and Richard Matheson. Um, oh, wow. I met them the first time I went up. They took me under their wing whenever they were in town. Uh, they would bring me bags of books. I think my librarian mentioned to them i was a really poor kid they would bring me shopping bags of books 
um, originally their own, and then later on other books that I should read. Um, um, and they would just give me lessons about how to write because the first time we talked, I said I wanted to be a writer. And I guess it's something they hear a lot from or heard a lot from kids. And they were like, oh, really? You know, and then I explained that I really wanted to be a writer. And I must have said something that convinced them, because from that point on, they te they treated me like a student, even though I was 12, 13, 14. They treated me like I was a student of the of the form. And um, what's kind of kind of cool is that years later, when my first novel came out, my publisher had tried to get cover quotes from both of them. And they were both very old and ill. And they got cover quotes, but shortly before each of them died, sadly, but it was too late for the book. You know, the book was already out. Mm -hmm. So when the 10th anniversary edition came out, the publisher made sure those quotes were front and center. And that, you know, I may have ugly cried when I saw those quotes. Um, but as far as other influences, um, uh, John D. MacDonald, uh, his Travis McGee mystery novels, hugely in influential on the way I cult uh, cultivate a character and evolve that character. My character, Joe Ledger, owes a lot to Travis McGee. Um, and I, I've read that series of 21 books probably 30 times. I read them almost every year. Uh, now I'm listening to them on audio every year. Uh, mm -hmm. Very influential. And even though I'm an expert in martial arts, the way in which John D. McDonald wrote a fight scene to explain details that you need in the middle of a, of a scene that in real life would take two seconds was very, very influential on me. And I, I've, I've um, now I teach writing fight scenes and, and that's one of the things I, I, I point out is how beautifully crafted those were. Um, also, uh, Ed McBain and Harlan Ellison. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't meet Ed McBain, I, I knew Harlan. Uh, the way in which they fractured paragraphs into um, fragmented sentences, sometimes single word paragraphs, so that there were more dramatic beats there and not just mm -hmm. big blocks of gray, very influential. And um, my, two of my uh, favorite and most influential writers are, are both still alive. Uh, James Lee Burke, um, his Dave Robichaud Mysteries, among my favorites. And uh, Joe Lansdale, uh, mm -hmm. who writes in every genre, who's become a very close friend. And in fact, his Hap and Leonard characters made a cameo in my last novel, uh, thanks to a conversation I had with Joe. Just like F. Paul Wilson's Repairman Jack is going to have a cameo in my next book because I'm friends with Paul Wilson. Um, and so that's a lot of fun too. Okay. So when, when you're writing, you know, a series like the Joe Ledger series, how do you keep track of events that have happened in the, you know, earlier books? Um, I have a very smart assistant with a long memory. Um, and she's been with me for num enough years that, that she knows all the Ledger books. In fact, she co-wrote, the Joe Ledger Companion, a nonfiction book about the Joe Ledger series that I consult a hell of a lot because there's a lot of stuff. I mean, I'll go through there just to reread the synopses of the previous books. Like, oh, wait, I did I, that was in there. And I'll have to go look at the file then to see that scene. Um, it lists the characters and so on. So it really does help. And I know George, George R. R. Martin and, and Charlene Harris and a few others, we, we, we've benefited from fans creating these companion books that are just awesome. Usually when fans say they want to create a companion book, we're like, yes. You know? <laughs> um, but also I, I, I tend to reread the, the most recent book or two or re-listen re to them on audio because those are the plot lines that I need to continue developing, you know, the, the character arcs and so on. And also the tone because the tone has changed over the course of 12 novels and 50 short stories of that character or 40 short stories of that character. Um, so I want to be able to um, catch the, 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 the same voice, especially if I'm coming off of another book of a completely different series or standalone, I need to get back to the voice of that series. And uh, so remembering details and, and recapturing voice are part of the homework that a writer should do if they're doing the next book in a series. Now you have a book coming out you know, on May 10th Got called it. Visual Aids. Keg in the Damned. That's good. You saved me on edit time, Jonathan. I don't have to have the book like fly up on the on the on the video. Tell tell if you could tell the audience a little bit about now it's a kind of a it's your <laughs> own take on the sword and sorcery genre. How does it how would it compare to you know kind of like a Robert E. Howard or uh, you know a Wagner like that like that 
that sort of uh, well, you know, those authors. Carl Edward Wagner is a lot more of an influence on me than Howard was. I mean, I love the Conan stories. Um, of the of the Robert E. Howard stories, probably King Cull is more because King Cull was more political than Conan was. Mm-hmm. And uh, I like political epic fantasy. That's why I like Game of Thrones. That's why I love Joe Abercrombie's first law novels because they're very political. I loved Roger Zelazny's uh, Amber novels because it was all family politics. All of that plays into it. And they're, they're, they're writers who have been influential on me. And, and uh, you know, I know George, uh, I've, I've chatted a number of times with, uh, with Joe Abercrombie via email. Um, I like that kind of, of writing, but it's weird. The origin of this story, it, it's it, talking about business. Cause this is an interesting business way this book came about. First of all, I've, I've always loved epic fantasy. If I tilt the screen up, you can see right there, that's a copy of Conan the Wanderer. Oh, yeah. yeah. My very first book I ever bought with my own money. Um, 1968 Lancer Edition. Um, so I, I'm, I've always been reading epic fantasy, and I love the swords and sorcery, the grittier stuff. But I never really thought I was going to write it. You know, when I got into, into fiction, I wanted to write horror. Then I got into thrillers and other things. Um, within publishing, there are little rivalries. In Macmillan, one of the big five, Tor Books, um, that, that imprint has a pretty big uh, footprint, a pretty deep footprint in epic fantasy. St. Martin's Griffin, which is my, the imprint I write for, does not, and they want to. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's always rivalries for you know, sales and everything else within companies. So at one of the meetings with the publisher, um, you know, the publisher said, we, we want to get more epic fantasy. Does any of you editors at this table know a writer who is either, either writing one wants to write one or um, is quick enough to be able to, you know, do something like this. And my editor, you know, said, I, I'll, I'll talk to Mayberry. So he, he stepped out of the room and called me and said, you know, do you like epic fantasy? And I, I you know, gave me, I've been reading it since I was a kid. Um, and he said, well, you know, explain the conversation that happened at the t- at, at, in the meeting. He said, do you have any interest in pitching something? And I said, sure, I, I, I have some ideas. He said, send me a pitch as quick as possible. Now, he meant within a couple of weeks. I actually had a pitch to him in, in about 25 minutes. A yeah. pitch. Um, and within two hours, we had the deal closed. Um, it was wow. the fastest book deal I ever had, two book deal to start the series. But the writing of it, it I, I set this world is uh, of Kagan is um, tonally probably closest to in that zone between Carl Edward Wagner and George R. R. Martin. It's mm-hmm. dark, bad things happen. It doesn't pull punches. Uh, nobody speaks in the pro- uh, the sort of proclamation way that everyone seems to speak in Lord of the Rings. Like um, some of the characters are always saying things, you know, uh, I will I'll draw my sword and, and not sheathe it until we have victory. You know, that we, we don't, my characters don't say that sort of stuff. Because also, you know, think about it. You're then carrying that sword around for days, unsheathed. That's a little silly. Um, right. So I, I try to ground it as much in the real world as possible, even though it deals with the return of magic that's been absent for a thousand years and um, uh, conquest of kingdoms and political clashes and so on. Uh, I had an amazing amount of t- fun writing the book. I was able to bring in influences of, of things that have always mattered to me. There's a character in there, a sorceress, who is both Tennyson's Lady of Shalott and Keats' La Belle Dame Sans Merci. It's both characters kind of blended together, both from those two poems, um, along with some other things, along with a little bit of Spencer's fairy, uh, uh, the fairy queen, you know, the daughter of the fairy queen is, is the same character. So there's a lot of literary references in there. There's also elements of love, Lovecraft because there's um, the two of the three pantheons of gods. One is the good guys are kind of the harvest gods. One is Hastur. Uh, Hastur is the king in uh, yellow. Yellow, yellow king, yeah. Um, and also known as the shepherd god. He's the god of the bad guys in the story. Um, and there's another group. Their god is Cthulhu. Actually, there's also another group that believes in Dagon, and they're not evil religions. They're people who, who worship those particular gods, um, and uh, it's it's fun to create those panth- pantheons and bring you know Lovecraftian elements in. Partly because I, I love the the Cthulhu mythos thing. I'm also editing Weird Tales magazine, which ties right. very well. I mean, those stories were published in Weird Tales, as were all of Robert E. Howard's Conan and Cull stories. Um, so it, it's kind of like a, a perfect storm of different elements of my life, my career, my tastes, 
and my viewpoints that collided into this story. And um, one of the really incredible things with this is my editor had reached out to one of my favorite, 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 favorite writers of all time, Michael Moorcock. Um, mm -hmm. I've read every single one of the Eternal Champions books going back to the, the 60s when they were first coming out in America, uh, 60s or 70s in the Lancer editions. Um, and he's notorious for not giving cover quotes. He's also notorious for if he doesn't like a book to send scathing letters. Um, and he gave us a beautiful cover quote and I, I got a beautiful letter from him. He loved the book, um, which touched my heart so much. I went up dedicating the book to him. I had yeah, that's a huge, and, that, yeah. that's a huge, uh, it, it, it's stamp it, of yeah, approval. It's a big I mean, Michael Moorcock cover quote. I, I can't remember the last time I've seen him give a cover quote it's decades. Um, and um, so I wound up dedicating the book to him. I moved the dedication I had for that book to the second book, to Sprague de Camp. Um, but Michael Moorcock dedicated the first book to him. And I have since asked him for something for Weird Tales. And he gave me an excerpt of the next Elric novel that'll be in my next issue of Weird Tales. So none of this sucks. <laughs> this is, <laughs> this is the, my inner 15-year-old inner year old is freaking out that this is happening. And the business part of me is like, oh my God, what a, what a lucky stroke for you know to drive this career and to, and to launch this new book because we have we have endorsements from by Michael Moorcock, Robin Hobb, James Rollins, Kevin J. Anderson, and Shona McGuire. Um, wow, that's some heavy hitters. Plus a star review from Kirkus. So you know, yeah. Well, I mean, you worked. You've certainly worked hard enough to get there. Some say that luck is when skill meets opportunity. True, true. But I, I have a lot of friends who are highly skilled writers, every bit as yeah. good or better than me, who just haven't made that break. And sometimes luck really does factor into it. Right moment. Like I know the agent that I got and I, I, I talked to 10 different agents before I picked that one. We kind of picked each other. But I had four offers of representation from top agents. She's the one that was most interested in me being able to go wherever my interests went rather than staying in a single lane. Mm -hmm. That mattered to me. Yeah, because with her, a good thing. Yeah, with her, I mean, and again, coming back to business, I can write four novels a year, which I often do, and they can be in four different genres, and they could even be with four different publishers, and they're not competing with one another because they're different genre. And that allows me to have more product out there without crowding my own publisher with too many works because they, you know, that, that person could not publish too many at one time. Uh, right now, St. Martin's will be doing two books a year uh, from me. Uh, a, a new Starting next year, will be a new Kagan book and a new Joe Ledger book every year from St. Martin's. And I'll be doing stuff for Athon and, and Weird Tales Presents and other, other uh, Simon Schuster and other publishers. Now, going back to Kagan, what about the, tell us a little bit about the main character. So Kagan, he's a, uh, he's a captain of the palace guards. His job is to protect the, the imperial children, known as the seedlings. Remember, it's a harvest religion, the seedlings. Um, and that, you know, he's oath bound to do that. He swears on his immortal soul that that is the job he will never fail in. And of course, he wakes up drunk in a prostitute's bed when the entire empire is conquered all in one night by the witch king and his army. The, the, the children are slaughtered. Everyone is killed. And it, and this is not this is not spoilers. It happens in the first couple pages. Uh, I mean, the very first chapter, the entire first chapter is Kagan Vale woke to the sound to the sound of his own damnation. So things have gone bad from the beginning. Uh, he's a city boy. He's used to palace life. Now he's an outcast. He's running from everyone. He's completely failed. He saw his own gods appear in the sky and turn their back on him. Essentially damning him and uh, he spends a, a fair amount of the of, of the book drunk and cranky and killing as many of the bad guys as he can find as he's slowly trying to put together who he is and what he's lost and and if, is there any way to kind of regain himself uh redeem himself he does find a clue to redemption um and it's not it's, it's religious it's it's not like in the way we think of christian redemption you know it's he wants to be the man he always thought he was. He was, and um, he's out there trying to fight back against the Witch King, who, you know, is has brought magic back into the world, and he's not at all skilled with dealing with magic. 
Um, he also is interesting in the way he fights because he's a palace guard. Um, uh, one of the things a lot of folks don't know about palace guards is more often than not, they would use short blades rather than long blades uh, if there was a scuffle in a palace because you know, you've got corridors, you've got crowds and tapestries. A short knife allows you to control the fight. His mother, known as the Poison Rose, was the best knife fighter of the age. Um, and he now has her daggers, which are poison blades. And that's, that's why the second book is called Son of the Poison Rose. He doesn't fight with a sword. He actually fights with a pair of matched daggers, which are technically the length of Roman short swords. So if you imagine somebody with two Roman short swords, that's the kind of daggers he has. Um, and he's an infighter. Uh, as opposed to a oh, he's not a duelist. He's a, he's a killer. He's trained to kill the people who are going after the people he's protecting, not to injure them, to kill them. So he's very brutal in the way he fights. And as a martial artist myself, I, I even though I'm a big man, I always was trained to be an infighter. And my, our, the master of our style trained all the big guys to be fast. We have power because we have mass. They do not expect a big man to be fast. So I was trained to be very fast. And I like knives, you know, as, as in terms of uh, fighting. Now, Kagan is not as big a guy. He's about probably five, eight, five, ten, somewhere in that range. But he's very, very quick. And uh, so his speed, his ruthlessness, and his skill with those daggers creates a different kind of fighter than we've seen in the typical novels where usually somebody gets a magic sword or a legendary sword, and it's all about sword play. And I, you know, you can fight against swords with daggers if you know that style. There was even a style of fighting called um, a spada e dagger, a you know, sword and dagger, and even mm -hmm. cloak and dagger, which was a real thing. You've heard the expression. They would use a cloak for uh, to hide the dagger and also to confuse the enemy, tangle up swords when they would fight. Kagan is, is crafty like that. He makes friends along the way, and then he starts plotting the overthrow of the, of the uh, usurper. How much research did you do for this book? And, and what sorts of things did you review? Books, uh, well, genres, uh, etc.? Well, I, I, I've read a ton of epic fantasy, and I continue to read them. Um, I reread some of the the uh, Carl Edward Wagner stuff, which sadly is out of print, but I have the copies because he was one of the the first since since Howard to bring uh, Lovecraftian elements into epic fantasy. So I like that, and also his character was morally complex. Yeah, his Kane is closer to my Witch King in terms of personality and skills. He's not a good guy, but he actually has a reason for what he's doing. The, the villain is not just black villain, you know, in terms right. of white. He thinks that, you know, he, the, the country that he's representing, Hakia, their religion was based on, on magic. And it was brutally suppressed by this harvest empire, uh, the silver empire and their harvest gods. So he felt that was, uh, that was wrong. So he's fighting back against an, an old injustice going about it in pretty extreme ways because he's also a dark wizard. Um, but uh, I kind of wandered off the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> I got, I got research. Kind of side research. Oh, research. Um, well, I, I did, I did, I, I borrowed a lot of politics from what goes on in the world now and in the past <laughs> because certain political dynamics happen over and over and over again different cultures different uh, reasons um i borrowed a bit of that uh i i researched uh different weapon styles of that you know my, my i'm more into asian weapons than uh U european weapons so I, I i did do a little more research in in that though i have also written about european we weapons i did a a whole non-fiction book on uh, sparring methods around the world which also you know all the different types of european fencing and so on so that, that played into it. I did a lot of research on the cosmology of the extended Cthulhu mythos, um, different types of agrarian societies and what their economies might be. A lot of the research doesn't show up visibly in the book because I don't want, I, mean, I don't throw big info dumps in. You know, right. um, I just use little things that make it, that give it a kind of a lived in feel based on the way people might've, you know, bartered, you know, in the in the the sixth century or or, or so on. So it's it, it's I, it's what I call a soft info dump. It's it doesn't look like I'm saying I did all this research. Now you have to read it. It's more like I did the research so I can add little subtle elements here and there. 
Um, but th that's the kind of research I mostly did. And a lot of stuff with uh, nature and with folkloric versions of monsters. Luckily, I've written five nonfiction books now on folkloric monsters. Um, so I was able to actually use some of my own books as research. That's you know. good. Yeah. It's efficient. All right. Now we're coming up toward the kind of the end of the hour. So what what sorts of parting words would you give to aspiring authors? Well, one, one thing that's useful is I on my if you go to my website, jonathannaberry.com, and it's M-A-B, not e, not M-A-Y-B. On that page, there's a whole subpage called Free Stuff for Writers. There's a comic book script, there's a query letter, the same basic query letter I use to get my agent. Um, there's how to write a novel synopsis and samples uh, and, and samples. There's all sorts of stuff. Go grab what you need. They're all downloadable PDFs, you know. But um, a couple things about it. Don't believe in the in writer's block because it's not really a thing. It's a label we give to a whole bunch of different challenges writers can face. If you believe that in the writer's block propaganda, it tends to stop you in your tracks. What mm -hmm. you should do instead is try to identify in what way you personally feel blocked. And then go talk to other writers because there are always, 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 100% of the time, solutions and workarounds. Just because you don't know them doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Also, a lot of what blocks writers is not writing a plot because they get to the point where their idea has petered out. They don't know what uh, idea is not a plot. Idea gets you started. It's not a destination. You need to have a map. You know, um, sometimes they uh, uh, they set too high a standard. Uh, th their writing does not read like Faulkner. Well, no, none of us are writing like Faulkner, sorry to say. So we shouldn't try. We should try to write like us. Don't, you know, uh, measure yourself against your favorite writer, especially in early drafts, because early drafts are just about story. It's not about the beautification of language, which leads me to my next bit of recommendation. Just because you may have a natural gift for storytelling, and most people who are called to the writing profession kind of feel that, you know, we still have to learn the elements of craft. Go research what voice and pace and, and point of view and figurative descriptive language and all these elements are. And then once you learn what they are, there's a really great way of getting better at them. Take your favorite novels, novels that you have read a couple of times before, and go through them again, not as a reader, but as a writer, looking for how that writer of that book used those elements of craft. And then go do it with another book you like and another. Read them as a reader and then read them as a writer and study the form. And that's one of the best ways to understand how to apply these elements without copying anyone, but how to apply those elements in ways that speak to you, the ways that, you, ways that enchanted you as a reader of that book originally. We learn from that. When I wrote my first novel, I had not taken a creative writing class. I got the 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 five or six novels that I loved the most that were in my genre. My first novels are in the genre of American Gothic. And I read them multiple times. I deconstructed them. I even wrote outlines of what I thought must have been the plot outline of the book that I'm seeing now. And by reverse engineering it, I was able to look at the carpentry and see how it was done. It's all there to be seen. You just have to know what to look for and you have to constantly look for it. And the last bit of advice I want to give a new writer or is writers on the way up, everyone will tell you how hard it is. Go deaf when they talk. Don't listen. Mm -hmm. We know how hard it is. I mean, that's, that's not a newsflash to anyone. If they can't offer a solution or a useful suggestion, they're not helping. So, you know, you, can, you know, if they, if they say it's difficult, you say, yeah, I know. So, so is rocket science. So is surgery. So is learning how to be a plumber. Everything is difficult until you learn how to do it. Stop getting in my way. Those things are important. All right. Well, thank you, Jonathan. And uh, can't can't wait for Kagan the Dam to come out and uh, check it out. So uh, hopefully the audience will go out and buy it uh, pre-order, right, uh, as soon as possible. Yeah. yeah. In fact, there's still time to pre-order it and get a signed book plate. Um, and, uh, if, in fact, I'll, I'll post actually, by the time this comes out, I think, uh, it'll already be out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I forgot, I forgot the sign book plate thing. If you want to order a signed copy of the book personalized, the easiest way to do it would be to order it from my local bookstore, which is mysterious galaxy books in San Diego. Um, it's, it's close to where I live. Every time there's a bunch of books for me to sign, they call and I drive over and they will, you know, take whatever your request is. 
for personalization and they ship anywhere in the world. Mysterious Galaxy Bookstore. You can get any of my books there and you can certainly get that signed. And uh, I hope you enjoyed Kagan. I, I've never had as much fun writing a book as I did Kagan. All right. Well, thank you again. And thanks, Sean. Yep, talk to you soon. If you enjoyed this video, hit like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.